Okay, welcome to Latin American Studies 201, Popular Culture in Latin America with John Beasley Murray. That's me. So today we're going to talk about the limits of popular culture. This is part of a continuing effort to define what popular culture is, what it means, what it might be, and we're going to see that that's a problem, that popular culture always challenges any definition that we come up with. And hopefully we'll look at some of the ways that that's so, in part by looking at two articles, one on postage stamps in Latin America and the other on the tears of Pancho Villa. So first of all, let's go back to the notion of what is popular culture. We started off, we established some provisional definitions some ideas, some intuitions. I suggested this definition as a working definition to start off with. What is popular culture? A way of life and or culture made by and or for ordinary people. I think this is an okay definition to start off with. That's why I'm proposing it. But I think it's pretty clear that it's also a definition that has plenty of problems. It has a tension between culture as a way of life and culture as a product. I mean, there's something recursive in including the culture as part of the definition of, uh, of culture, but that's the point of that definition, or to point to two notions of culture or two traditions of thinking about culture. One, culture as a way of life, an anthropological definition, cultural, the habits and rituals and and things that we do sort of quasi-automatically, everyday life. And then culture as an aesthetic tradition or culture viewed from a tradition which is about aesthetics in which culture is a sort of series of, of products that have special meaning or convey special meaning in, in one way or another. So in that second definition, we think of poetry or novels or comic books and so on and so forth as as culture as examples of, of culture and then there's also a tension here when i have another and or as to whether popular culture specifically is produced by ordinary people produced by the people or consumed by the people in some ways that tension plays out in terms of what we think about, say, mass culture, cinema, TV, radio, print, books, for instance, and what we think of a sort of more uh, know, folk culture, for instance, but also, but increasingly those, that difference gets problematized, gets, becomes blurry when we think about the internet, for instance, the internet is both something that we consume, but also provides platforms in which we can produce blogs or Facebook or uh, YouTube, for instance, right? They're a little bit of both. In some ways, the uh, YouTube is, you know, a, a content provider, but we are the ones who produce the content. As I say, uh, this definition also you know, begs the question, what is culture? It includes cultures within the definitions as, as though we knew what it was uh, already. And uh, it also perhaps begs the question of as who are the people or who are ordinary people? What does it mean to be ordinary? Um, what's the difference between, is the people everybody or is the people just a certain subsection of the, of the population? Is there a difference between ordinary people and, I don't know, the elite, for instance, or some other category of people who are not ordinary in some ways? Isn't it more democratic, at least, to suggest that everyone is ordinary, whatever their pretensions or positions or status or rank in life? So this is a definition that gets us going, um, but provokes as many questions as it answers. So another thing that we've been doing is uh, to think about you know, words or images or ideas that we associate with popular culture rather than trying to come up with a, a full-blown definition. Uh, we've been trying to think, okay, when, when we think of culture, uh, popular culture, what are the kinds of adjectives or qualities or characteristics that, that we think about? And um, 
we, we looked at Black Orpheus as perhaps a way to help prompt or, or think through that. And we saw in the first few minutes the opening of, uh, of Black Orpheus and uh, the notion or the association of popular culture with a certain liveliness, right? A certain vibrancy. The fact there are these drums that keep on banging all the way through or almost all the way through. Um, it seemed very, yes, yeah, very, very vibrant, very emotional, right? Very sort of charged, very um, close to home, I suppose. Um, in in Black Orpheus, the emotions were mostly positive, um, but not solely positive. But lots of you commented on the fact that uh, it seemed very, I don't know, uplifting, right? Now. Of course, Black Orpheus is a is a representation of popular culture. We might wonder where it is, whether it is also an instance of popular culture. Um, in some ways, it's an art film. In some ways, it is you know uh, a, certainly very much a view from outside of Brazilian Rio de Janeiro popular culture. But we see the ways in which the film encourages these associations, right, with liveliness, with emotion or affect, with a certain positivity. We see the way in which popular culture is, is seen as everyday. We see these everyday habits. It opens with these women going up the hill in the favela, uh, bringing back water or other products and so on. We see its association with the marketplace. Uh, we also may see the way in which, you know, these are people, this is a culture which tends to be at the margins, which is perhaps normally uh, overlooked or taken for granted. We don't even perhaps necessarily always give it the name of culture, which again, from the aesthetic position or the aesthetic tradition seems to be something special. This is something every day and therefore something we don't even necessarily think about too much. It's accessible in many ways, right? Uh, anyone can be part of the parade anyone can start dancing and singing or whatever in black orpheus um it's democratic in that sense right in that sense of being part of the people or being part of the products of the people or the way of life of the people it's common it's common in in the sense also that it establishes a, a community it's what we get on, on the street uh, it is um, the, the, the culture of uh, everyday happenings, everyday life, or, I mean, we also see in, in Black Orpheus something a, a little bit different too, it is the way in which popular culture takes over the street at this particular moment of, of Carnival. The way in which in Carnival, popular culture um, takes over the, the center of the city and perhaps gives it a certain life, which is otherwise deadened or seems to, is portrayed as being dead in uh, that image of the modernist architecture and office block, uh, the one moment at which the music and the drums seem to fade away, and we get the long shot of the character who seems to be you know, alienated or lost within this depopulated square. There's a notion perhaps that popular culture is resistant, therefore, that there's a political aspect to it, um, the popular culture goes against official norms. Later on in the movie, we see a few moments in which um, the police are trying to give order to or trying to sort of hold the line in the midst of the, of the carnival and um, obviously feeling certain uh, raggedness or, or that the, there's something almost futile about that attempt or something difficult about that attempt to sort of hold popular culture back to keep it within uh, its limits. Uh, it's also perhaps uh, threatening. So perhaps here we're, we're, we're going the gamut from a sort of positive, optimistic view uh, of popular culture um, to think about the way in which it is threatening not only necessarily to the authorities or to you know, official culture, uh, but also we see the way in which the character Eurydice in the opening uh, few sequences of, of Black Orpheus doesn't feel quite at home. 
there seems to be a sort of undercurrent of something a little more dangerous, a little more almost sinister in, in that particular movie. And then we can, we, we can contrast all these attributes with what we might think of as, as official culture. We talked about the very opening image of, of Black Orpheus, which is a Greek frieze representing the, the classical characters of, of Orpheus and Eurydice, um, that this movie both gives new life to and, and attempts to replace in some ways. And if popular culture is seen as so, so there's the way in which official culture is sort of seen as, I don't know, dead or um, uh, petrified in some ways, right? Not moving in the same way. Similarly, perhaps, you know, official culture or high culture, elite culture is often seen as more cerebral, more a matter of cogitation than a matter of you know, letting, letting go and letting flow. Perhaps. There's sometimes a dichotomy between a notion of tragedy as a as a more serious genre as opposed to comedy, for instance. Although we will see if we carry on watching Black Orpheus that that there is tragedy at the heart of that story too. If popular culture is seen as everyday, elite culture is seen as as special and, and celebrated. Right? It's the it's the kind of thing that well to anticipate what we'll talk about a little bit later you know goes on postage stamps the kind of thing that um you know the state gives money to it's the kind of thing that is reviewed in the newspapers and so on if popular culture is accessible and official culture elite culture is restricted either either directly or indirectly it may cost money it may require a certain or seem to require a certain level of, of education for understanding. So where popular culture is common, then other forms of culture might be thought of as elite <coughs> and beyond and belong to particular institutions, museums, uh, for instance, the National Theatre or, or other such sites of officially sanctioned and canonized culture. So it's easy to think that, you know, popular culture is resistant. If popular culture is resistant, other forms of culture are less so, give the official line in one way or another. And if popular culture is threatening, the elite culture is safe. These are associations. We're, we're going to complicate them as we continue on. But again, there are, there are places to start, places, uh, ways to, to start thinking or, or continue thinking uh, about the topic uh, underhand. We can also think about instances or examples of, of popular culture. And again, the opening of Black Orpheus helps us with that. We see samba, we see popular music, we see dance, we see children's play, um, kite flying, football, soccer. Uh, we see carnival itself. I mean, the film is, is based around uh, uh, carnival as an instance of of, of popular culture, fashion, costume, again, sort of everyday ways in which we dress up and perform and, and, and present ourselves, but also costume as, as something that um, is demarcated as, as special too in the, at the time of uh, carnival. Habits, we see uh, again the kind, the, the bringing of the, of the water, the bringing of um, uh, provisions, uh, back to back to the house, um, those sort of that you know everyday market transactions, for instance, uh, ritual, uh, and, and religion is also something that features within uh, Black Orpheus again later on in the movie in particular, but uh, Carnival itself is associated with Lent, so with the Catholic calendar. And we later on in the movie see an instance of Afro-Brazilian candomblé. And then myths and legends. So both the kinds of stories that are told, um, the, sort of, the so-called old wives tales, for instance, or um, urban legends. Uh, but also, of course, Black Orpheus is based on a, a, a legend itself, a, an ancient 
a Greek legend or myth. Then I'd like to underline a couple of things that we've talked about, the way in which popular culture establishes boundaries. Um, it just, it, that's a counterpart or element of the way it in, in which it establishes communities. It establishes who is part of a community and who isn't. So again, Black Orpheus helps us to think about that. We see Eurydice arriving in the city from outside and feeling a little unnerved, partly because she doesn't fully belong, right? And uh, that is shown by her, I don't know, skeptical or, or nervous or, or worried reaction to everything that is going on uh, around her. But we've also seen the way in which popular culture also has its internal boundaries. It's stratified in different ways. There are distinct positions available or provided, for instance, to different genders, very clearly in, in this movie. Um, but also it can be racially stratified, uh, stratified in terms of, uh, of class, of location, geography, and so on. Um, so popular culture is about boundaries, internal and external. But it also threatens those. It, it threatens to overspill those boundaries, including the boundaries that it itself establishes. So this might lead us to think, what are the boundaries or limits of popular culture itself? And so that's why I chose these readings for this week. Um, uh, Jack Child's article on stamps and Andrew Noble's article on Pancho Villa and emotion tears because I think those would not immediately come to mind as examples of popular culture or perhaps even examples of culture at all. So these two articles probe or help us probe or think about the limits of what we mean by popular culture, of, of any definition that we might have of popular culture. So first of all, postage stamps. Um, this is this article by uh, Jack Child. In some ways, I don't think it's the most sophisticated or complex of articles. It's perhaps the sort of article you might expect a stamp collector to uh, to give or a collector to give in some ways, right? It's a, it's a list. It's a, lots and lots of different examples of uh, different stamps and different uses of stamps over history, which is which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure that the theoretical an analysis is so fascinating, but it does pose a few, it does pose the question, right? Are stamps popular culture and in what way might they be included and in what way uh, within that definition, in what way do they trouble that definition? I thought they're ordinary and everyday, or at least I guess they uh, traditionally have been. Stamps may be more and more of an archaism as the article itself mentioned, now the email or Instagram or whatever take over as modes of communication. I don't know when the last time uh, you guys bought a stamp or put a stamp on an envelope might have been. Uh, it may have been a long time ago, if ever. But in their heyday, at least, uh, absolutely, they, they cut stamps. You, you'd see stamps every single day as the post arrived. And, uh, but you wouldn't, they'd be overlooked as well. They, they wouldn't be something that you'd take much notice of because you'd open the envelope. There, there's something sort of transactional about them, right? There are means of uh, getting a message from A to B, getting a letter from one place to another. And perhaps we don't think about the message that stamps themselves convey. They're produced for everyone. Um, they're universal. Right, and in that sense, they're they're popular, and they're part of. They're certainly made for um, the people, a national people. They're, they're um, you know, they're part of, you know, the the national community. As child uh, explains and expresses, habitual and e easily overlooked, as as I mentioned. Um, on the other hand, there's there, there's another part of them which is. They don't need to have pictures on. Right? There, there's something excessive about the fact that stamps have pictures, or that most stamps 
uh, have pictures. If they were simply the utilitarian uh, transactional thing, if, you know, they, they, they'd just be a, you know, a register or, or uh, an indication that a certain price has been paid. But the very fact that stamps have illustrations, um, I think, uh, links to the notion of, uh, of culture as something that goes beyond the necessary in some ways. I, I have some stamps here. By the way, these are, these are the Canadian stamps, um, which are really tiny. I mean, those these these it's very hard uh, to see the pictures that that may, they have on them. They're, these this particular series, at least, is a diverse selection of natural, mostly natural scenes, cliffs, sand dunes. Ice. I suppose they're all associated with Canada in one way or another, though there's no kind of description of them. And this is like, why, why spend so much? And this, I think, Jack's, Jack Child's um, uh, question. You know, why does the post office, Canada Post, in this this instance, um, spend so much, put put so much attention on these tiny little things? Uh, which which can barely be seen and, and, and are seldom uh, noticed, and, and and that gets that gets child to thinking about what messages they convey, and, and these are these are messages conveyed by the state by an, by an official body, right? So in that sense, they're they're not produced by the people. You can't make your own stamps. In fact, that's a criminal offence. I suspect there will be uh, forgery. Uh, so in that way, there, there are forms of culture which is top down, rather than uh, bottom up, and that enables them to, to be the vehicle for official ideology. In some ways, I think Jack Child is trying to su suggest right that there's something very effective of, about stamps as a way of getting um, ideological representations or particular representations into basically everybody's wallet or pocket. Again, in the heyday of stamps, when everyone had them or had some on them. So stamps help question the limit or the boundary between the popular on the one hand and the official on the other. In many ways, we can think of them uh, in terms of culture and, and popular culture. Uh, in other ways, they are no more so than, I don't know, a tax form or other, um, or other forms of I don't know, discourse or other documents produced by uh, the state. And then in uh, Andrea Noble's article, uh, we're looking at tears, specifically Pancho Villa's tears, or the representation of Pancho Villa's tears <coughs> in the Mexican Revolution, Villa being one of, I know, the most well known mythologized revolutionary figures uh, from. Uh, the Mexican Revolution of 1910 uh, to 1920, and she examined a, a series of uh, instances in which uh, Villa cries, in which Villa weeps. And uh, she's interested in what that says about a code of sentiment, of, of emotion. Tears, of course, are also ordinary and everyday. Uh, everyone, at one point or another, produces them, everyone cries. Um, although uh, maybe that production is unequally uh, distributed, they're also, as, as she notes, gendered. For instance, some may cry more than others, um, and that, so she's interested in that interface between, as we'll mention in a moment, the biological and the cultural, right? But everyone has the capacity to cry, at least. Um, and, and 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 it's not uncommon for people to cry for many different reasons. They're associated, of course, paradigm paradigmatically with emotion, right? If popular culture, if we're thinking of popular culture as something that is affective or emotional, um, you know, tears along with laughter, or I don't know, sweat perhaps for fear. Uh, are, are, are paradigmatic, you know, 
signs, indexical signs, to use the Persian term that uh, the child suggests, of, of emotion, uh, of affect, of the way in which we are moved. Right? Um, we produce tears. They're bodily reflexes to some extent. And they're also excessive, right? They're excessive because they um, they go beyond the boundaries of the body, right? They cross the bound, they go from the inside to the, to, to the outside. And they're excessive, or they seem to be excessive, often because we, you know, the, 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 because they become regulated, right? So hence, some of these terms that uh, Noble uses, sort of histrionic or, or, or weepy, and so on. Right? There's, there's the notion that um, there are times and places when we should cry and times and places when we shouldn't. And perhaps there are uh, types of individuals or type of forms of subject uh, whose uh, weeping, whose crying is either uh, regulated or used as a, a stigmatization. And, and and especially in terms of uh, of gender, as um, uh, as Noble says, so she starts with this image, right, of uh, Pancho Villa before the the firing squad, and uh, weeping at the feet of the guy who is um, instructed or in charge with the task of Villa's execution. And uh, in some ways, that's that's unsurprising. If you're in front of the fi firing squad, you are liable to be to be upset, right? Um, but there's a code of honor, especially perhaps within the Mexican Revolution. But not only, you know, that the real man, the real revolutionary, laughs in the face of such danger, um, goes to the firing squad unmoved. Um, that this is a chance in which the supposed victim. Uh, or the person who is being put to death gets one back against the authority that is putting him to death by showing his resilience or resistance to be carried away. But you can't help, perhaps, crying, right? Uh, so tears seem to be more of a matter of instinct and biology, perhaps, than they do of culture. We think of culture... You know, it, although tears convey a message, and we think of cultural cultural products often as conveying a message of, of some sort, um, they do so despite ourselves, perhaps, right? We, we don't necessarily um, seek to cry. In fact, often, again, because of these cultural norms, we're often enjoined not to cry, although there'll be other moments at which uh, crying is is encouraged or shows of emotion are, are encouraged uh, but sometimes we can't help it so they seem to be more about biology the message that they send or the signs that tears constitute uh, can easily uh, seem to be you know beyond human hand to put it that way so perhaps what's important, and, and I think uh, Noble equivocates a little bit on this, it's, uh, it's unclear always what her emphasis is. Perhaps it's important, what is important is less the tears themselves than how they're represented. She's very interested in the ways in which um, the tears of Pancho Villa are photographed or filmed or written about either by Villa himself or, or by others, right? The way in which they are framed or mediated um, uh, tears as as much the object of a cultural discourse than as themselves a form of cultural discourse. But I, I again, I, I think that um, she's a little ambivalent about that, whether she wants to see tears as culture or she wants to see tears as something that culture uh, represents. Either way, I think tears, the, the limit that tears question is that between the cultural and the natural again culture and, and nature are often uh, sort of paradigmatically seen as distinct and counterposed um, but tears question that distinction so I want to just uh, end up with some thoughts or brief thoughts on uh, what 
this line of thinking has might have told us or led us to think about the limits of popular culture and these examples uh, that we've been given. So the first is that if popular culture is always a matter of simultaneously positing but also challenging limiting limits, and I think it is, it both establishes boundaries and questions them at the same time. It's perhaps unsurprising that among those limits are the boundaries that demarcate the difference between popular culture and other forms of culture, and even between culture and other domains. In other words, among the limits, the popular culture questions and challenges are its own limits, the limits of what popular culture is or might be. And therefore, part of the definition of popular culture has to be its resistance to definition, the fact that it isn't easily uh, defined. But hence, perhaps, it's also its interest, right? its capacity always to surprise, to test our expectations and preconceptions.